Uh, welcome to Six Scales 2023rd. Link the document in chat. Uh, add yourself as a tiny. Okay. Um, we'll have uh, so, so we have two things on the agenda. You know, feel free to add things for things folks want to bring up. Okay. Uh, first one. Um, Qbert BMI phase count metric is uh, missing the phase label. So this. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is something that we had that uh, it saw internally. Um, this this actually came out of um, the issue where uh, we had the panic in the vert controller. Um, one of the things that we noticed, like when we went through and actually changed out uh, the vert controller for a new one, um, we noticed this uh, where we lose the uh, the value or the off the. I think we lose one of the labels off of the um, the the my phase count metric where it just shows up as value. Um, so um, I, I don't know what it is that the, the issue is. I, I don't know, let's see if um, there's any more information that comes out about this, but uh, it looks like we just dropped a label off. Um, might just be something in the for controller that um, maybe needs to be changed. Okay. All right. Um, so no further comments on that one. We can go to the next, which is BM pool design discussion. Hey, yeah, I can talk about this a little bit. We, we've had um, several discussions in the past and everything, uh, even in this form. Um, and we had a previous design document at Google Doc. And um, what I've done here is try to, to distill all the previous discussions we've had and try to get all the features, and everything that we were interested in having and kind of condense that into a, um, a community design doc, uh, which is kind of our community design process and uh, revise our um, terminology a little bit to align a little bit closer with uh, concepts we already have in Kubert and, and Kubernetes. That's kind of my main goal here is to make it feel cohesive, like a cohesive API. So we've had a lot of great discussion so far. Um, I think we're, I, I feel pretty, good about this. Uh, I feel like it's something that's becoming actionable. One of the um, items that you point out, Ryan, uh, was this selection policy, something, uh, how do we pick a VM during scale-in or perhaps an uh, update as well? Uh, and I, I made some changes. Did you want to look at that, maybe hash that out a little bit here? Or is that something you'd prefer just to do in the... Um, into github later this is this is fine no we can talk about it now i'm trying to find um where it is i think it's somewhere down here yeah you're on it right now uh so proactive it's i call it selection policy now there's it's the same exact struct under um update strategy oh, okay. and uh, scaling strategy okay because uh, i think it makes sense for both and uh maybe before i get into that uh one of the things that i've kind of a lot or landed on here is this idea of um, for our pool, whenever we're creating VMs, after we create them, how do we manage them? Uh, and I came up with these, I think I might have stolen this, <laughs> this terminology from Google uh, uh, GCP, but this idea of an unmanaged VM pool where it's just gonna create VMs and never touch them after that, uh, an opportunistic Kind of update and scale in policy where we're only going to touch things that are inactive so not actually running uh and then a proactive um scale in update strategy which would actually act on uh running virtual machines so it gives people a lot of control over how they want to manage whether they want to manage the virtual machines in their pool as pets uh so we just want to create them and don't ever touch them after they've been created we'll handle the rest or begin kind of transitioning into more of a cattle approach as well, uh, where we do things proactively on their behalf. So we kind of give the gambit of uh, possibilities here. Uh, and for the proactive approach, that's the one we're specifically talking about here, how do we select the virtual machines that we're gonna act on? And Ryan came up with this kind of neat idea about um, creating a list of um, priorities or ordering that allows people to select 
um, virtual machines based on um, like uh, labels or what node they're on or things like that and actually have that be ordered. So we kind of filter through or trying to match uh, VMs based on um, what the user has said they want to select first. Yeah, do you want it? So for this, for this discussion, so maybe we can catch everyone up. Um, like the, uh, like the idea, I guess, behind like the virtual machine pool is like, uh, I think you talk about it in one of these sections about the difference between it and, and replica sets. Um, do you want to like talk about that? And then we, that can kind of give us like a little intro into kind of the, the use case, the goal, and then we can kind of maybe dive into like, you know, why you know, what's like, what's this mean? Like scaling and, and stuff like why, why it's relevant in, in terms of what, you know, how, how it impacts a virtual machine pool. Sure. So we have a virtual machine instance replica set. This is something that we wrote a long time ago. And uh, this is kind of like one of the initial controllers written for KubeVirt. And at the time, what we were doing is we were looking at Kubernetes and trying to envision what virtual machine management would look like in this ecosystem where people are managing pods. And the thing we came up with was a virtual machine replica set, which would act like a pod replica set. And that really closely resembles how people would want to ma uh, manage ephemeral, stateless workloads. Uh, in practice, that's not super helpful for virtual machines because uh, it works in the VMI which is just the running instance of a virtual machine and not the stateful virtual machine object, which then instantiates VMS. So the end result here is we have uh, a controller that works like a replica set that works on ephemeral VMs, which really uh, only, sorry, there's a big loud car going by, um, handles the cattle use case and actually just kind of a niche uh, portion of the cattle use case. So it's not terribly useful uh, for a lot of people. The idea with the VM pool that separates from this is we're looking at what kind of operational patterns people use in traditional infrastructure as a service platforms. So think AWS, um, Azure, GCP. And I'm trying to think of ways where we can align those operational expectations from coming from those platforms with KubeVirt. And in those platforms, you have um, things like in AWS, you have a auto scale group, which um, has VMs that scale out and in, but those are stateful virtual machines. You can remove virtual machines from the auto scale group. You can debug them. Um, you can snapshot them. You can do all these kind of stateful actions on them, which you can't do with the VM replica set or the VMI replica set, I mean. So all that said, the VMI replica set matches the container management uh, workflows and the VM pool matches the kind of inf infrastructure as a service management um, patterns. That's kind of the distinction that I'm making. And we, we think, or my expectation is that the VM pool would be much more usable uh, for people that are used to using virtual machines in the VMI replica set. Are there any questions for anyone on that? Uh... It, it, so here, here's one for me. So like the distinction, so virtual machine pools, this is a group of virtual machines and um, they, you know, do they, this is the virtual machine API. So not necessarily the virtual machine instance API. This would, would this imply that um, since there's sort of like, would this assume that there's sort of a runtime associated with a, a virtual machine pool? Like, um, can you have a virtual machine pool with no virtual machine instances? Sure, uh, you could uh, technically do that. So you create lots and lots of virtual machines in the pool, but the run strategy would be set to halted, for example. And uh, what that would do is it would provision storage for each one of these virtual machines. It's not like a no-op. You're not just posting empty VM specs. You'd be posting VM specs, uh, storage is gonna get provisioned for them, all this stuff. And then you'd have the option to start them at your own, whenever you want it, I guess. Um, that's an interesting use case. Okay. Um, so like um, we have we have this this idea of the virtual machine pool. Okay. And then so like um, let's say um, uh, like it, the v what other states like can can a virtual machine 
be set to? Like, would those all apply in the case of a virtual machine pool? Like, if uh, other than running, like, um, could we say set to? I, I don't know if there's a pause or a stop state. Would that apply here as well? Uh, it's running and halted are the primary ones that we would have. Uh, there's they would all apply. It's just uh, stamping out a VM um, and anything that you can do with the VM, you can do with the VM and the VM pool. The things that we'll have to kind of think through a little bit um, is what we consider availability within our VM pool. Like um, uh, I have to think about um, like the auto healing was one of the um, criteria or um, one of the features that I was interested in where we um, auto recover virtual machines and things like that. I guess it's a little, it's like, okay, here's, here's a simple example. Um, let's say we have a VM pool with a replica count of three and all three of those virtual machines have a run strategy of halted, meaning we're declaring that we actually don't want them to run. Uh, I guess we have three virtual machines in that case, but none of them are running. So are we considering that that condition is satisfied? I think we are, but I wanna make sure that we're all on the same page on what the replica count three actually means. I see, okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that makes sense to me. I guess like, well, the thing is that, um, that um, like, I, what, what would be, like, I'm trying to think of the use case. Cause like for part of me, I'm thinking of, well, uh, um, I guess, it, well, how would I say this? Like if you want to, if you have th the pool, we have virtual machine objects. Um, there are VMIs for those. Um, we have the state in the virtual machine pool, but we also have, so we have states on the virtual machine objects, but we also have a state on the virtual machine pool. Like, like we would be sort of uniform. Like, would we say we want, or we, or this, maybe this is sort of where you're getting at with unmanaged. Like, because the way that I'm, so I'm sort of coming at this is like, okay, I have a pool of objects. Um, there's some uniformity of those objects. Like, um, like I'm trying. Like I'm thinking kind of in like a job. Like I'm trying to go to the state. Um, like I'm trying to go to like, I want this many virtual machines and I want them in this state, I want them running, um, for example. So like the virtual machine pool will try to always have that many virtual machines that are running. So, you know, if we're, if we have virtual machines that are all halted, that would imply that I have halted as my, in my virtual machine pool. Like, would we have, um, is, is that kind of like the level of like, state we would be propagated from the pool down to the virtual machines or is this like a case where like if we have unmanaged where we just kind of um kind of see what we let them kind of is that what you're kind of getting it with unmanaged that we can get to these states where we're in between but unmanaged certainly you can get into these kind of strange states uh because you can do whatever you want you can have a number of replicas for example on your vm pool that don't match the replica account because uh an unmanaged you would be the user that's created the pool would be uh, in charge of actually scaling in those instances. So you could say you want to replicate count three, but actually have five in your pool um, and unmanaged. The thing that gets kind of strange is, is that we're pointing out is that you could have uh, three halted virtual machines. Uh, and what does that mean with unmanaged versus kind of these proactive and opportunistic uh, selection or management styles? I'm curious if maybe when we create virtual machines, if uh, we aren't using the unmanaged, um, well, I don't think that makes sense. I think people get what they ask for. Uh, so if somebody has asked for VMs to be created and they don't have the run strategy set to always, meaning they always want this VM up, then I think that's just what they get. They get virtual machines that aren't running and they've declared the best to the state that they wanted in. Right, so that would mean like, so how would they do that? How would they just declare that the VMs being created are run state always? They would, would they set that in the pool? They would no, you set that in the VM config. I see what you're getting at. So there's a VM config object that it maps to pools. You can have the one to many relationship where you can have VM configs uh, mapping to lots of different pools or just one pool or whatever you want. And the VM config object itself 
is really just a VM object without a status. Uh, and the reason I okay. think it makes sense to have a separate uh, object for this is I don't want people trying to start VMs that are mapped to pools. I, I want to be distinct on the intent of what has been created. So I'm calling a VM config. You can't start it, but it's just a VM spec without status. And in that VM spec, that's where you would declare your run strategy um, as always or as halted or whatever. Um, so the expectation is if you want virtual machines to be running in your VM pool, you set run strategy to always in that VM config, and it's always going to try to keep these VMs online. There's not going to be a case where uh, it isn't always trying to keep them up. Okay. So one of the, one of the things I was thinking of, like if um, sort of the difference between like we have the virtual machine instance and the virtual machine, the virtual machine has this run state, the virtual machine instance doesn't, it's just the runtime. Um, the virtual machine pool has this virtual machine config object where we declare our intent of you know what we expect um, to happen. I, I'm wondering if like, if we have some sort of config like this, do we, do we need to have, uh, does it have to be just virtual machines that get created? Could it be virtual machine instances? Um, you know, if we, if essentially at this point we've abstracted the idea away, like, I mean, we, I could basically say in this config, I want something running. Do we need the virtual machine object at all uh, in the middle of this? Oh, that's an interesting idea. Um, oh, well, you need the virtual machine object because we're, we're treating it as stateful uh, virtual machines rather than stateless. So VMI is stateless, VM is stateful. Uh, what if the pool essentially replaced the VM object by it, had, by it having the state instead of the the virtual machine object. Well, the state is so no, one to one with the, every VMI. So that's why we have the VM object. So you could have a pool that, how would you have a pool, for example, that represented the state of all VMIs within it? So there's like PVCs and everything associated with all of that. I mean, I guess you technically could. Okay, then, I see. So you have that, that's the other, maybe that's the, so the, so the, you would have, so the virtual machine object has the PVCs. Um, and the virtual machine config would reference the it would re reference the PVCs in addition. So it references, references everything that that virtual machine instance ends up using. Yeah, there's workflows, for example, that um, allow you to provision and clone storage in your VM spec. So the day of volume templates, for example, you can say, I want to take uh, this source PVC and I want you to clone a new PVC and use it for this specific VM instance. And that's all encapsulated in this VM object. Uh, once we remove the VM object, that logic of how the state's provisioned and everything would have to be moved somewhere else. Uh, and that is where things get tricky. And also it makes things tricky when we talk about things like um, how do we um, detach virtual machines from this pool because the thing that mapped all the states, if it isn't the VM object, so we can detach that one object that kind of encapsulates everything that's involved with that VM. Um, but if that object doesn't exist and we somehow offload that to the VM pool, then when we detach a VMI, we wouldn't have that, it'd be strange trying to correlate these things. Okay. Yeah, I think like, so one of the things I was thinking of is like, we could use, if, if, we, if we were to make a bunch of assumptions, we could say like there's a dynamic provisioner for storage um, and, and we essentially offload that. We say, okay, we're going to assume whenever we attempt to create this object, that it's just going to have a PVC allocated for it um, or it's allocated ahead of time or something. Um, that could be possible, but so you mentioned that there are some tricky cases where like, okay, but, like, but maybe we can, maybe this is configurable. Maybe we could say like, okay, we don't, you know, we expect it to be managed elsewhere, uh, entirely elsewhere. We're just going to do, you know, the VMIs and, and whether they're running or not. And we're just going to look for names of PVCs and to be appear or, or to not appear or whatever. And then we just kind of let, you know, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Um, we just let the, let the user handle it. Can we do that? You technically so can. I think that's a departure from the expectation that people have coming to this platform from other infrastructure as a service platform. So that's, I'm trying okay. to, uh, I guess, um, one of the realizations I've had over the past couple of years is that 
I think I would like people to begin interfacing with the virtual machine object more often than the VMI. I think the VMI is a special case for people that uh, maybe really understand some of the um, uh, fundamentals of how Qvert works. That for people who are expecting VM-like behavior where they can stop, start their virtual machine, perhaps suspend the state and then resume the state, and things like that. I want people to begin getting accustomed to using the VM object itself, because that's that's what's actually capable of doing those types of actions. See, okay. Yeah, and I mean, there's I guess... not a lot of, uh, like, um, I'm trying to, maybe one question I would have is, what's the, um, why are you asking? Because it sounds like you're more comfortable using VMIs over VMs perhaps or what's what's the thought here i i'm just trying to understand um more about where i like where you're going with the virtual machine config and, and kind of the general idea um behind it because like i w my thought is that is that if um you know what is the like my like my thought is like what would be the difference uh between or so what would be the point of a virtual machine object if it's because it almost seems like to me that the pool is sort of just another form, another abstraction around VMIs, just like VMs are. It's just more of an advanced case. And I think you you do you you answered it in that like we want to define, we want to be able to define all of the things that are going to go into this virtual machine instance, like our, our runtime, well ahead of time in, in this config. And, and we want to essentially have control over. All of the things like the like the PVCs, everything we want it all in a config, and we wouldn't be able to get that if it was just a VMI to virtual machine pool relationship. We'd have to make an assumption that the, a lot of other things are handled elsewhere. That's, yeah, that's, that's kind that's of pretty. That's pretty good. Uh, yeah, I think that's about as accurate as we can get. And I think that being able to treat VMs as a standalone unit that can be separated from the pool and not lose anything, that's valuable. So you can take your VM, you can remove it from the pool and you still have a working stateful virtual machine that functions without having any of the states involved with the VM pool. I see, yeah. I mean, I think like it, it, that makes sense to me, like what you're, the, the argument that you're making, it makes, that makes sense to me. I think the, um, um, I, maybe this is I, it could be something that's sort of out of scope at least at least at least initially in the, in the design here maybe it's something we could call out because I do I think it is possible unless we want to push you know put people away from VMIs I think it is possible to do that to have sort of the virtual machine pool be the abstraction above VMIs and kind of let some other things handle you know PVCs and, and other things. Um, um, other infrastructure maybe that has been built. And so there, I think there is a possibility for it. I mean, well, how should the, we, I guess- the, Well, the isn't that the VMI replica set? Why wouldn't somebody use the existing abstraction if they just want their- Because you don't, statements? well then you don't, well, it's it, it's the, you don't get the, the scale down, the scale in that comes with this, that you, that you like replica sets wouldn't have. It, it, well, it isn't, it, well, I don't know if it's it's a it's a an argument necessarily of stateful versus stateless. Like the like the, I, you could still have. You could still have many VMIs and they could be stateful, um, in the the replica set model. But I mean, you lose what you lose is the scale, and that's where it becomes the problem. Mm -hmm. We we can add scale into VMI replica set with these policies and things like that. But there is no state like that's like I don't under, like it's not like a for example in the Kubernetes world a stateful set where we're provisioning storage uh, for every pod. Um, there's no such concept of the VMI replica set, so it's it doesn't it, it's stateless. Like you, there's no storage. Yeah, I mean, I guess maybe I I might have a different definition for for or maybe a different assumption for what it like state for what state is here because like the I guess it would be, so maybe state's not the right term. You could have a pet in a virtual machine replica set. You could have something that you don't want, you want to treat as 
in, more important than say, I mean, you 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 would you'd have VMs that that aren't necessarily the cattle, and and it doesn't like you're not you could have that kind of relationship in a replica set where you have even if you don't have state like you don't that that then maybe that's so it's, I guess I'd say it's a separate part. I don't part think of you it. can because you can never, for example, something as simple as restarting your VMI, you lose everything. So it's it's treated ephemeral. Like one of the definitions I would guess as a pet is that you. Uh, really want to maintain this thing, uh, maintain the uh, whatever you've configured on it and things like that. And with a VMI, uh, anytime any sort of disruption occurs, you lose all of that. So it doesn't really exist. Yeah. It I'm just exists to... for the runtime. Like, right, you shut it down, it's gone. Like, it's right. Totally gone. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what to call it then. Okay. If you had VMs that you, if you had a set of VMs, I guess the example I use is that if you had 10 VMs and you had three of them that were using um, whatever had had important workloads on them and you didn't want to lose those just yet, like you could get rid of the seven, you could scale down for the seven of them because they don't matter. They don't have workloads that are important to you right now. They're all the same VMs, but three of them are being used. I don't, what would you consider that then? Because if it's like it's sort of it's not necessarily a pet because we're okay with, I guess it wouldn't be a pet then because we're okay with like whether it's ephemeral, but we want to be careful about how we're managing it. Yeah, it just sounds like a uh, advanced um, scale manager wherever that is, whether it's the VM pool or the VM replica set, you can maintain the, basically the VM pool is gonna be something that can give you that exact same behavior, uh, but also with enhancements. So you can have um, your stateful workloads managed in the same way as your stateless. There's nothing preventing you, for example, for uh, from creating your VM config to look exactly like something that we've managed by a VM I replica set like you don't have to provision storage you could use container disk and your vm config and then you have a bunch of essentially stateless vms uh run, being managed by vm pool so every time you restart those vms there's nothing from the previous um, run that exists so there's nothing preventing us from treating the vm pool like an advanced vmi replica set okay no, that's that's what I wanted to go with. This like if there's sort of a path forward with that, because I, I think there are use cases for that if you're using VMIs that way, and and that would be, you know, if if, if essentially it's just that we just you convert to just a VM object and you kind of use it in the exact same way, where you don't necessarily add storage, you let it be handled elsewhere. Um, Absolutely, there's not there's nothing preventing that, and that's that's a totally fine use case. Okay. Yeah. No, I think that that's mainly where I wanted to go with it. Is sort of that. Um, the difference between those two things. So you talked about also the, the virtual machine config. So this is going to contain the um, the VM objects and as well as sort of the configuration for the pool, or is it not? The, or the no, it's in the all I can, and... The VM config is totally isolated from the VM pool. It doesn't have anything. All it is is a VM spec, and the VM spec contains at very basic. All it's going to contain is uh, how do you want this VM to run? So do you want to always run, which means that if it gets killed, we're going to restart it. We're always going to try to keep this thing online. And in addition to that, what does the VMI spec look like that this VM is going to run? So um, when we're talking about translating from, for example, the VMI replica set to the VM pool, what you would do is you take your VMI, put it into a VM config, and then set the run strategy to whatever you want, presumably uh, always always want this thing running while it exists. And that's it. And you're, okay. you pretty much got an enhanced VMI replica set. And there'd be one virtual machine config to a one-to-one -one relationship to, to a pool, or would there be many? There'd be a one-to-one -one relationship where uh, a VM pool can only map to one VM config at a time, but a VM config can map to multiple VM pools. Uh, if that makes sense. So it's not, it's like a, yep. Okay. It's a one to many from the VM uh, config standpoint and a one to one from the VM pool. And that's something else to discuss. If you make a change to your uh, virtual machine config 
the assumption here is, uh, depending on how the update strategy was set, that those changes roll out. Or let's say you map your um, VM pool to point to a different VM config, then we would start, uh, depending on the update strategy, either rolling out or launching new instances uh, opportunistically or not doing anything that's unmanaged. But um, that's another kind of uh, operational pattern that you get with VM pools that don't exist with replica sets, VMI replica sets today. Okay. Yeah, that that would be a good that would be a good topic we talked about. Um, let me see. Did let me pause. Do are there any more questions? Do people have any other questions or any comments about the general idea? we're discussing. Okay. Um, okay, we can just keep going then. Um, let me, we'll, let's talk about the role, uh, the, um, the update. I think we, let's see. So let's see if I can find it. Um, update strategy. Okay. So we have unmanaged, opportunistic, proactive. Yeah, you want me to run through that real quick? Yeah, so it's, talk through these. Like, so you okay. mentioned that, like you said, when you change a, a config object, so that's that's what would trigger this. We change config object, and then one of these policies will be applied. Yeah, exactly. So, um, if you change your VM config, appoint the VM pool to a different config, then that's where this comes into play. And we have three kind of buckets here. We have unmanaged, which means that if you change your VM config or something mutates there, existing virtual machines will never get touched. They're just gonna always be what they were at the time of creation. Uh, and the user has the option to do whatever they want there. They can manually update them, they can whatever. Opportunistic is uh, where we are only um, updating the offline config of a virtual machine. So the virtual machine object is considered an offline config. The VMI is the running instance of that virtual machine. It's the online config. So we would update the offline config, meaning the VM. And uh, then once that VM restarts someday, it would pick up the new updated config. But we're not touching the live instance. So we're not doing anything proactively that would actually destroy uh, the running virtual machine instance in order to perform the update. So that's opportunistic. If somebody shuts down the virtual machine, we pick up the update. And the last bucket here is proactive. Uh, and that would be, uh, I'm, I'm thinking that should be the default. Um, and the default uh, proactive solution is where a VM um, config gets updated. We are going to begin rolling those updates out proactively to all virtual machines, meaning applying uh, the changes to the VM and then restarting the VM in order to pick up those changes. Uh, and this is where we talked about selection policy. Um, this would be how we, we um, define how we select which uh, VMs to do in what order. Uh, so we could have, you know, do by label first, um, do by node uh, first only. Um, and then the base policy would be something like random or do the oldest first. In addition to uh, this proactive strategy, we also, at the top here, we have this max unavailable, and that's what's going to throttle um, like how, how we do the rolling updates and things like that. So we're not going to uh, be able to perform a proactive update unless we can, um, or I guess the guarantee we're making is we're not going to perform any sort of proactive action uh, that involves more than max unavailable uh, VMs uh, going offline. And unavailable, I'm defining as a running VMI that has condition ready set. So it's something that's passing the liveness uh, and readiness checks. OK. Yeah, my question was going to be around like kind of the general idea of eviction. Like, how would we? You know, what would be like our, our policy? I think that kind of answers it with his uh, max unavailable. I mean, we're basically, this is, you know, this is pot disruption budgets, basically. Um, we are, we're setting some sort of expectation here. I mean, you could even set this, like, for example, like, so I could say, 
you know, if I really care anything that I consider running, I can, I could consider important. So I could do, um, or I could actually get away with just doing opportunistic. That would give me like the case, okay, after the VM, VMI has been removed, we'll just wait till the new one comes in, with, you know, so don't restart anything. So that would be like, that I think would be equivalent to a hundred here because we're not going to let anything restart. Yeah. I think so. um, yeah. That's interesting. Okay. It pretty yeah. much is. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, the the other thing that I thought of, because um, when I first read this, I was I thought um, I thought where you're going with this was um, uh, I thought about the you know like we could have you could have VMIs in different states. So you have it here, like your ready conditions false. Um, like one of the things maybe we could have here is we could select. Um, well, actually, maybe this is what it is. Like whenever you had a, a something that's unavailable, those are chosen first. Some sort of policy, like I think ready condition might be it. So like it would be if I, if I selected um, whatever, 25%, then we're going to pick the, the ones that are not ready. And I can control that ready condition. So that would give me the control over, you know, when we have VMIs that are just not in a state that, you know, they're shut down or whatever, you know, maybe they're whatever state they're in, they're, those are chosen first. Um, regardless of what the ordered policy is. Is that, was that how this would Yeah, work? they're shut down. I think they'll immediate, regardless of this proactive thing. Um, so if somebody says proactive and they have a bunch of VMs that are what shut about down. Halted? Cool. What about halted? halted no, that's, that's halted. Shut down. Okay, same. I mean, there's, it's kind of the same. So halted means that you've declared the intent that you don't want your VM running. Shutdown means that the uh, VM is not running at the exact moment that you're looking at it. And that could be a transient state, meaning that uh, it could be shut down and immediately getting restarted. So I have to be careful in how I use the terminology. Let's say halted. We're saying that a virtual machine is declared that we don't want it to run. And in that case, uh, with the proactive strategy, I would expect all those uh, VMs to immediately get the new, new change. Like, there's just no reason that I can think of that this ordering or anything like that would matter for those VMs. So the selection ordering or selection policy, uh, the way I'm viewing it is it's only something that applies to VMs that are in an active running state and how we uh, perform the update for those because that's destructive. Okay. So then this is, um... Uh, active running state. So we, but we can have VMIs with a false ready condition. This could be literally like a VMI that's in scheduled, right? Yes. Like, all right, yeah. So this would be, this would be targeted first before these policies kick in. That would be the idea. Let me think about that. Because we have an active running virtual machine, but uh, no, I don't think it would be targeted any differently. Um, it would so, just be that that specific instance that you're talking about wouldn't um, be at, it would be one of these unavailable virtual machines. So it would be throttling how quickly we can proactively update virtual machines. It wouldn't be selected first necessarily or last or any, it would still fall within that selection policy because it's actually a VMI that exists for a VM. So it's an active, there's an active instance running there. Okay. So what would be a case then we could, that this would be where we would, this would get selected before any of these policies. Max unavailable throttling, um, it's not, I, what do you mean by selected? Are you saying when this would come into- uh, Like when we're doing the update. Yeah, when we're okay. doing the update where we have, let's say we set max unavailable 25%. Um, yep. And so we're gonna select that, uh, we have to select some VMs that are going to be removed and updated. Yep. Um, and I kind of where, where I'm going with this is like, um, you know, what, um, so like ready condition false. Um, this is referring to to what? 
So uh, there's if a VMI is running for a VM and ready condition is set to false, I'm considering that an unavailable VM. A VM that has no VMI is also an unavailable VM. Uh, so Max Unavailable is saying that we are not going to do any sort of proactive action if we find X number of VMs in this unavailable state. So if you have um, 100 virtual machines and 25 of them are unavailable, then when it comes to performing the update, we're saying that nothing can be selected to update because uh, we do not have enough available capacity within our pool to perform the update. So we can't do a destructive action of updating running virtual machines uh, because 25% of them are offline right now. We don't want to take any more offline. It's, it's a protective measure to make sure that we don't take everything offline at once. Right, so I guess my, where I was going with my question is like, um, the difference between a VMI, like we have a, we have a VM, we have the VMI, uh, the VM is, we, we set it to running. We have, a, it, our VMI starts coming up. It reaches scheduled. It's not ready yet. Um, it's, it's still unavailable. Yep. It's still unavailable. Okay, yep. so, okay. So because it's unavailable, um, we're, we're, we're adding to this number, okay. Yes. It becomes available once the readiness and liveliness checks pass. Liveness, I think that's the word, not liveliness, liveness, yeah. Okay. Um, and if there, none of those are set, I think it just becomes ready as it hits running. So that's another. Yeah, so wait, where, where I'm kind of going with this is like, if we have, let's say we have a VMI, we trigger an update um, and if right before we trigger the update, we have this VMI that's that's launching. It doesn't reach running. Like part of me is thinking like, can we target this VMI before it gets to running? Like, and, and have it be something we want to update because it's, um, if it's not a running workload, like let's just kill it first. I mean, I guess that would be newest, but. Uh... Yeah, so you're talking about this once, but it's kind of like an edge case. You're saying that uh, a VMI has been created. It's somewhere in between, the phase is somewhere in between um, scheduling and running. So it's not quite, it, it, the pod hasn't even like, we haven't started the QMU process in the yeah. VMI yet. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess we could optimize for that. That could be a selection, um, one of the criteria here. Um, I don't know what we would call it, but we could call it something like um, uh, provisioning first. Like if a, if a VM is stuck in this state of um, almost running, <laughs> not quite yet, and we know that it's not online yet, that we can select it first. I don't know what we would call it, but sure, that's that seems feasible. Yeah, that's the thing is that could be something in, in selection is something that that could be in here too. I don't know where it fit though, because it's not, it wouldn't be in either of these. It'd be, it'd be yeah, somewhere else. It could be an policy. You just put it at the very top and say, select, Oh yeah, I guess uh, you could do, right. You could just do the list, right? Okay. Yeah, I guess you yeah, could. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Different states of the VMIs or something. Okay. I'm not I terribly mean, worried about that specific one though, because it, it all will get sorted out in the end. It's just that that VM uh, will be allowed to completely start and become ready before it would be acted on. It, it will. I was just thinking about it in terms of like, okay, um, this one, this could satisfy something that's that's not ready at the moment, and we could let's do some work on it before we kill something that's already yeah. that's already running, just yeah, sort of so. as an optimization. Yeah. And there there are cases, for example, let's say we've created a, a VM pool, and um, some VMs are stuck in this pending like scheduling state for a really long time. That can happen if there's resource constraints. So we'll create right. the pod and the pod will always be in scheduling until resource freezes uh, freeze up in order to um, actually do something with that. Uh, yeah, we can target those. Okay. Uh, okay, so we, we, have our, we have our rollout. Um, we control it with our policies. We have our, we can set how many we want. That are available. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. 
Okay. And then the maybe the other one is the other interesting one is this scale in. So the, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, using the same terminology for scale in as I did for update strategy, we have the unmanaged, the opportunistic, and the proactive buckets. And uh, with scale in, unmanaged means that we're never going to delete your virtual machine or the state or anything like that. Um, opportunistic means that we're only going to scale in uh, VMs that are in a halted state. Like, I guess actually, yeah, I think you want to declare that the run strategy is halted. So we'll we'll tear down the ones that you've said that you don't want running. Um, and uh, within the opportunistic and proactive, so proactive again is just going to mean that you're going to tear them down in whatever order uh, the selection policy has. But uh, an opportunist, opportunistic and proactive, we have something new, and this is the state preservation field. Um, and this allows us to prefer, uh, preserve the state of a virtual machine during scaling. So what this means is essentially we're going to orphan any PVCs that are associated with a um, virtual machine during scaling if uh, somebody sets the um, preservation state to offline. And I'll explain what that means in a second. And what this allows is that when we do a scale out again, uh, all that storage is going to be already existent. So it's already going to be provisioned for that exact instance. And it's going to improve, reduce the provisioning time because storage already exists and it will boot up quicker. So we're saying that we're going to optimize scale out by preserving the state during scale in. Um, I have uh, three, um, three options under state preservation. Disabled, uh, I think, is going to be the default where we don't do any of this um, preservation. Uh, so once you do scale in, you, you lose those VMs forever. When you scale out, you get fresh new ones. Offline, uh, I'm calling it offline because this aligns with our snapshots um, terminology. Uh, offline means that we are going to preserve the offline state of a virtual machine only. So that's the PVCs uh, for the virtual machine will remain present within the cluster after the VM's deleted. And then the VM during scale out, the same VM will get recreated and adopt those uh, exact same PVCs. And the online, this is kind of a future looking uh, feature that uh, we can't actually do right now, but I think it would be kind of neat. It would be on scale in, what we would do is we'd actually suspend the virtual machine saving both its PVCs and its memory state. And then when we do scale out, it would be like an instant boot because you'd already have, you'd be taking the memory state from the previous virtual machine that was that instance count in the, in the VM pool. And when you scale in, you save it off. And when you scale back out, you would use that exact same memory state uh, and it would be like a super fast boot time. Cool. This is like, yes, yeah, like save and restore could be one of the things that uh, we could use here. Yeah, so there's a really cool, here's my thought behind this. You could do a pre-warming of your virtual machine pools. So you could say, I want um, a thousand virtual machines in this VM pool. And then you could scale it back down after they all started to like three. And then as capacity is needed, you get like instantaneous VMs starting. Uh, mm -hmm like as you scale out up to a certain point because you pre-warmed them all. Um, so it, it could be kind of a neat optimization if we ever get there. Cool. Yeah, that would be. Any questions from other folks? So let's uh, let's say this. Uh, we'll go through and go through an example, maybe. So um, <clears throat> if I um, so I can if I've got ten VMs, um, we'll, we'll go through like proactive again. Like um, I change my number of replicas, you know, from ten to five. Um, I've got, um, you know, I'm going to do this proactive. I'm going to do you know an ordered policy by. Um, well, I'll do it by a blue base policy by by newest, like, so I go down, I scale on the five. So now I'm just going to kill five VMs, the, the ones that are the newest based on their the timestamp, right? 
Yeah, their creation timestamp, I think, is what we would go by. Okay. And then I can even control a little bit more, but if I had some label selector there, I have like, okay, I've got one very important VM and maybe it was created the newest, um, but I want to make sure that, or say I have an unimportant VM, whatever, and I, it was created, it was, it's the oldest VM, so it contradicts with this one, we would select the, the label selector first or yep. the label selector, yeah. Those take priority first, and then there's the base po policy. And if no base policy is set, then we assume that you just want your ordered policies. And uh, if, for example, you just have order policy set, uh, if we can't match, then it would be kind of like a mix between proactive and opportunistic because we can't, We essentially the update or scaling would block if we couldn't match. And maybe I'd send some sort of event or something like that. Cool. So did you want to talk about this auto healing strategy at all? Yeah, I can do that real briefly. Uh, that might not be something I immediately implement. Uh, it might be like a follow on. Um, the auto healing strategy is something that I got from um, how AWS manages their auto scaling groups of EC2 instances. And what happens is if a VMI, or I'm sorry, just to make any ter terminology that make any sense in AWS. If an EC2 instance uh, is failing its liveness and readiness probes over and over and over again, uh, the autoscaling group's just gonna delete that uh, EC2 instance and reprovision a completely fresh new one. Um, so the, the idea here is in the pool that if a, uh, if a VM is just constantly restarting and failing its liveness and readiness probes or whatever, uh, we can delete that instance, all of its state, and reprovision a completely new one. So this would be somebody who's wanting to manage cattle uh, specifically, and they want auto recovery of like a corrupted VM. Like if a VM ever gets in the state where just is not going to boot ever again for whatever reason, then we have in the ability to like totally kill off that VM, all of its state, and automate the reprovisioning and recovery of that VM. Um, okay, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I could see a lot of configuration around this, like um, that we could do. You know, could be based on time or number of failures. Or yeah, exactly. It's incomplete. I would say um, that's incomplete because we do need the number of failures, the time between failures, things like that. Uh, I need to. I'm gonna make a note of that. Um, I don't think that's going to be in the initial implementation if I'm writing this at least because uh, it's kind of an advanced. Okay. Well, it'd be good. I mean, we can, since we have it here in the doc and it's something in what future we can, you know, we'll have, we can get all our thoughts out about it and we can, um, maybe it doesn't need to be implemented, right? But it'll be in design. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Uh, I need to flesh that out. I, I have more thoughts on that. I hadn't. I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't realize it was so incomplete. Okay. Um, we've covered, okay. covered a lot of this. Um, they didn't scale in. Uh, oh, detach. Oh, that's a good one. Detach is a, is, a, is a neat use case. Like, so we take a, we take something out of the pool, we, we essentially take it under our wing, like you know, the admin's wing, like we just want to manage it ourselves now, and then it gets replaced with a new one. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's that's cool. Because then we can, like a lot of the use cases you could see is like, okay, we need to do some sort of advanced debugging um, on this VM. Like we don't plan on bringing it back. Like let's just, we don't care. Like bring up a new one, and we'll just do, we'll analyze this one. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we covered all of the, um, I think that was literally all the sections. Um, oh, naming, oh, that's another good one. Uh, naming, like, so the um, so the names, uh, well, you wanna talk a little bit about naming and how it would-, how it would Yeah, go? jump back up to the top uh, with the config uh, options. I have, no, a little bit down. Uh, no, I, 
No, it's uh, it's in the actual API um, example or not is it there. Um, I have name generation. Yes. Okay. Um, this is how VM objects and other objects within the pool get named. And um, here you can set a custom VM prefix if you want. So this is going to be a string um, that's going to just be the prefix of all VMs. By default, it's just going to be the pool name as the prefix. Uh, maybe that's fine. Maybe I don't even need to add VM prefix to this. I just thought maybe it makes sense that people might not want the VM pool to be the prefix. Uh, but the things that actually matter here are uh, the postfix. And the postfix is always going to be an integer um, and it's going to be consistent. So it's just going to be um, like dash one, dash two, dash three, dash four. Um, and that's going to be predictable. So the idea here is that we have a VM and a prefix, a pre prefix and a postfix will always be predictable and reused for, for VMs. Uh, what this allows us to do is uh, for people who want to pre-generate either secrets or config map references, let's say everyone, um, somebody wants a unique cloud init secret for every VM in their pool. They can auto-generate all of these secrets with uh, uh, putting the postfix in the end, like dash one, dash two, dash three. And then uh, we will have um, the VMs that get created automatically pick up uh, those secrets because we will uh, append the VMs postfix to the secret references. Uh, so if somebody says they want their secret to be, um, I don't know, my, my cloud and that secret on the VM config object. If they set this append postfix to secret references option in the generate uh, the name generation field here, when we actually create a VM from that VM config, we are going to see, hey, there's a VM secret ref here. They have this Boolean set, and we're going to post um, we're going to add append the postfix of the VM to the secret reference to pick up the unique secret for this VM instance. So the whole point of that is that we have predictable um, postfix for all of our VMs, and that can be applied to do some kind of advanced logic around how uh, VMs get unique secrets and config maps. Uh, does that make sense, Ryan? Because I know this is one that was important for you all. Yeah, like so. The idea was that we um, we have a lot of secrets that are out there. Um, you know, whatever it's like, some keys they're all unique, and um, we just want to create a bunch of VMs, and we want all those VMs to be able to get their own um, their own secrets. You know, whatever we we can choose that we control the naming of the secrets, so we could, and we control the naming of the the pool VMs, so we could line them up so that the VM pool always selects the the a unique secret every time um, when it when it uh, when it goes to find secrets, and same with config maps. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, and then um, yeah, so the name generation is predictable. So we do like you mentioned. I think you have the um, like the pool one, whatever two, three, and then and the idea. I think I'm asked to comment on this. Like if you delete VM pool two, and you scale up. Pool, my pool two VM gets replaced, right? The name, um, we create a new VM two. Yeah, exactly. The only um, kind of caveat with all this is if you detach my pool two here, then uh, because that, that VM technically still exists, it's just not part of the VM pool anymore, we skip it. So we skip it and we would create um, like my pool four uh, because we'd want three replicas. Uh, we see that one of them can't like the gap there can't be created because it already exists and we would have to skip it. Um, I think that's the only way it would be handled. So it could get a little, there, there, there's not a guarantee, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's not a guarantee that it, the order is always going to exist. And same thing with um, scale in, like scale in, we might select randomly items within uh, the pool, uh, VMs within the pool. So you'd have like lots of gaps, for example, and the integer. And then once you scale out, it's going to begin filling those in as it can. So I make sure that there's no expectation that uh, 
that the sequence exists in order. It's more of a, this is a predictable naming scheme, not a, um, has anything to do with scaling or scale out, or even the replica count won't be represented by this postfix. Yep, that makes sense to me. Yep, I mean, you could always control it if you need to, if you really, really wanted to. You could make it essentially that way that you know you can create you know with labels or whatever if you really want to go out of your way but the idea is like you said we just want to know we want to have a way to name these things so that we can associate objects with them yeah okay cool all right well we're um, over time um i mean uh and final questions or thoughts from anyone otherwise we'll we'll call it here yeah, sorry we talked the whole time about the impulse stuff. This is it's it's really helpful, at least to me, to to hash all this out because I think we made a lot of progress in this discussion. Yeah, no, this this good. I think this is like one of those things where it's going like in terms of like this group, like there's a lot of like we talked about some of the performance, like you mentioned with um, you know, the pre-warming and um and I think there's even like a um uh somewhere in here like a I don't know if it's um, to run these in parallel. I forgot. I think there is a, a config for it. But the idea is that we can have something that um, that we can, if we have a bunch of VMs that kind of fit this use case, we can do it. We can create them in a, we can also use it as, a, as a, an API to create things in a performant way. Yeah. Makes sense. Cool. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Catch you later. Bye. Thanks. Have a good day.